respected chairman, all senior panelists and audience, Guru uh, Namaskara. Uh, my presentation is Future Farming Technology. So the challenges of agriculture or horticulture industry we have, in fact, we have been discussing since yesterday on this uh, aspect. This elevated increase in demography, especially the, the population, from present 7.6 billion to uh, 10 billion by 2050, uh, and which is also likely to be little more. In fact, if you take the fertility and other scenarios, it's likely to hit 16.5 million as per report. This is going to be a big number to feed indeed. And yet another thing that is like silently happening is urbanization in, is increasing, something like 2.4 billion people to, to towns and cities. And this is likely to increase the, uh, the income level. And associate, once you have the higher income, then food preferences will increase and then child obesity and uh, related problems. The net result of these two things is we will have to produce 70% more food by uh, 2050, plus the food of animal origin will also be uh, needed more because the urbanization is increasing and it will be something like from 36 kgs to 45 kgs per person per year, that's the kind of thing. And once we have this kind of things happening, the meat production will have definitely the impact on the environment. The other issue is uh, the current use of natural resources is highly uh, stretched and this is like already 25% of the world uh, land is degraded and about 40% is rated as slightly or moderately degraded and water resources are all, already highly stressed and as per an estimate about 40% of the world's population is already living in water scarce area and land shortage has resulted in small farms, farms. and once you have the small farms and above, above scenario the lower productivity is adding to the poverty. And if you carefully look at it, agriculture is primary cause of this day. Apart from this, agriculture is in one or other way responsible for about 80% of the global uh, deforestation to happen, agriculture related activity. So as per an estimate, about $1 trillion would be required to uh, manage irrigation water alone in developing countries or in developing countries. You just imagine the kind of other uh, aspects and uh, what is the kind of money that the world will have to spend towards this and how careful we should be. Another aspect, the third aspect is climate change and we all know about it and it is really reducing the productivity and agriculture is one of the primary causes of greenhouse gases and because of, and in the past 50 years already about two-fold increase in greenhouse gases has happened and it's likely to increase. Agriculture, forestry and other related activities are really hampering this and net result is again reduction in the production. The last and very important aspect that I thought I should share is food wastage is a massive market inefficiency and it's an environment, it is threat to the environment. Uh, like 30 to 50 percent of the food that we produce is never eaten. That's something which is very, very alarming and it also consumes about 25 percent of the fresh water where we are living, already 40 percent of the people are living in uh, water scarce area. If this food production were to be a country, it would have been just next to China and US in terms of greenhouse gas production. Just imagine uh, such a uh, thing happening uh, without to with our knowledge or without our, our knowledge and how careful we should be. The net result of all these four factors, demography, climate change, natural resources, and food wastage, we have this hunger and poverty, and we need to have strategies that are very different strategies necessary to produce food and also deliver food to the place where it is required. Now the kind of thing that we are looking forward for is disrupting the production system is only possible with new technologies. This is known. Disruptive approaches are possible with the intervention of the new technologies and the new technology that we are talking now is agriculture 4.0 or it's also called digital farming or digital agriculture or smart farming. Uh, what is this basically? See, the traditional agriculture is undergoing a fundamental transformation from time to time, which we have seen, and that's the reason why we have been able to fill our bellies. And the first technology revolution in agriculture made really impressive strides, like agriculture 1.0, if, if you call it, this, was, this is something which was there up to uh, 1920, from the beginning to 1920, and that's the agriculture, it is like labor intensive agriculture, low productive agriculture, and all of that. And then agriculture 2.0 is somewhere from 1920 onwards up to 1990 or so. This is the agriculture where green revolution happened and irrigation water, wood seeds, hybrid seeds, seed production, fertilizer availability, 
so fertilizer availability and pesticide synthetic pesticide availability and all of that happened in fact rapid increase in uh, food production that was accounted by the world and uh, different uh, geographies happened but in this agriculture 3.0 is generally referred to the uh, the time frame from somewhere 1990s where gps uh, became an, a reality and gps adoption gps signal adoption for manual guidance uh, started in early 90s and this was used largely in like aerial sprays and then first automatic steering started in 19 1990s and during 19 i mean during 2000 the guidance accuracy actually improved to about one centimeter which is really uh, very high level high level and the moment that happened the applications become myriad and it entered into many operations this agriculture board at zero is something that is coming agriculture is going to come and at its heart science and technology is at, at its heart in the sense uh, it's fully scientific driven and if this will this is likely to bring boost to uh, science, I mean, to precision agriculture. That is simply because cheap and improved sensors and actuators, low cost uh, microprocessor, and then high bandwidth, cellular bandwidth and cellular communication, and ICT systems, involvement of ICT systems, and that too they are cloud based, and big data analytics, and all those routines that are required to uh, acquire and analyze big data is going to make a big difference. And this particular new, uh, I mean, 4.0 uh, digital farming aim to improve the needs of the consumers and re-engineer re the value chain. So thereby the wastage is minimized and the delivery of the food would happen properly. So agriculture operations are likely to be, uh, likely to happen very different. That is because of the advancements in sensors, the devices, machines, and information technology. And this is happening, in fact, every year is a better year with respect to these devices. Then the involvement of application especially the it involves the application of water fertilizer pesticides across the field in a targeted manner not just spray and come but spray where it is really required and then abundant and clean energy such as sun and sea water would be utilized in this endeavor uh, not like what we are doing at present then farmland would be there in desert look at that and then vertical space is going to come into food realm food production realm and then reduce the food wastage through technological intervention please expected to this now how to do this and how the economies that are already trying to do this are anywhere that is happening how it is happening if you carefully look at it it's either expansion or intensification while expansion is like where you have more land and intensification is in the same piece of land try to grow vertical with the with the advent of these or with the involvement of these technologies if you carefully look if there is a capital and then land area, if these are, these are the two things, this trajectory, how like a country like Australia is trying to do expansion, but still involving all these technologies. But if you look at Europe, which is less in land, they're trying to do intensification, like be it poultry, greenhouse, horticulture, dairy, or any of these are intensification, like trying to adopt technologies heavily uh, without expanding the land. But this kind of ventures also require high capital. Like when you have low capital and low land availability, like intensification would happen in kind of what is happening in our country with respect to rice. So there is also situations where extensification is happening for crops, I mean this is a cereal crop, where trying to withdraw the inputs that are there. This is the kind of scenario, but in all of this, uh, in different geographies, technology is something which is common, which is being adopted very uh, extremely highly. Now, what are these new technologies and solutions in agriculture 4.0? There are three general trends that we see which have potential to disrupt the system because we need to look at the disruption. Unless that happens, we will not be able to meet the challenges that we look at. One is produce differently using new technology. Second is use technology to bring increased efficiency in the food chain. The third is incorporate cross-industry technologies and applications. Let's see each one of them briefly. Produce differently using new technologies is what? Like vertical farming, desert horticulture and seawater farming, algal feed, feedstock, and sustainable plastics and bio kind of bioplastics. In this, maybe first two of them, let's concentrate two of these vertical farming and desert uh, horticulture and sea farming. See, vertical farming is basically it's like vertical farming is a process of growing food in a vertical stacked layer. There are layers there. Vertical farming encompasses range of growth systems of different scales 
users, technologies, locations, and processes. Then it is particularly suited for horticulture crops, especially leafy vegetables for now. And the process uses about 90% less water, which is what is making it to be very disruptive, and less fertilizer while boosting the productivity, uh, which is quite high. The countries like Netherlands already producing about 35% of their country's vegetables with the use of just 1% of their farmland. They are going really vertical. Similarly, uh, UK, many countries are every year this, 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 you know, this particular aspect is increasing. If you carefully look at this, the systems and subsystem elements that are there in vertical farm uh, process flow, everything is accounted into this to make it more efficient. Be it water, nutrients, heat, light, seeds, sowing, harvesting, then uh, you know every part of it is taken into account and then it is designed very carefully to achieve that efficiency. Basically vertical farming uses fundamental those uh, uh, processes such as like uh, deep water culture hydroponics, uh, nutrient film technique of hydroponics or aeroponics or aquaponics. These are the basic techniques but they are modified a bit to suit them. Now what are the categories of vertical farming? You have stacked horizontal system where multiple levels of traditional horizontal growing platforms are used. Like you, we have traditionally one platform growing, but now we try to stack them up one above the, one above the other to be qualified to have vertical farming. Then vertical growth surfaces. These are like cylindrical surfaces and where you try to grow the grow, grow the crops. Now there's another uh, agriculture, like urban agriculture, like building integrated agriculture, BIA. This involves waste infrastructure in the uh, in the uh, in the in the urban area, and then rooftop glass houses with single layer production. As a as a in vertical farming, generally these are not considered because due to their similarity to conventional protected cultivation. So this is simple conventional protected cultivation or urban horticulture or agriculture. But to be qualified to vertical farming, it has to have the multiple layers. And so between these two methods of vertical farming that we discussed, if you try to look, in, look into first one, stacked horizontal system, this is frequently adopted one for commercial production for now. And it, it's very amenable to use the existing structures for this particular uh, methodology. Then it, uh, it comprises multiple levels of traditional horizontal growing platforms as I mentioned to you. Large scale adoption is, is what is the method which is largely adopted right now. The different types within this is like we have simple glass houses where this is adopted. You can see multiple layers here and they can be adjusted into different directions to ensure that they get the nutrients and light and amenable for the operation. The other one is it is controlled environment. In the first one, environmental is not controlled. The second one, environmental is fully controlled and now we have the multiple layers. So this second one is actually qualified to be called as a plant factory. The third one is multi-floor tower. So within the control environmental facility, you have multiple floors, and each one of this floor, floor could be differently environmentally. It could be different to suit to different production systems. Thereby you have the high verticals happening there. It also gets into like uh, the balconies of the building. Uh, it's also under multi-floor uh, towering system. The second type of vertical farming we listed there was vertical growth surface. Here you have green walls, it could be an inclined growing system or it could be a vertical or inclined, uh, just like this. Uh, the other one is cylindrical growth units, just, just like this, yeah, like this. They have cylindrical units and within this is, it is housing the nutrient play system. And this entire thing is housed either in the glass house or in the environmentally controlled facility. This is how it looks like. You can see the vertical. And you also can see the cylindrical type of thing. Both of them are heavily adopted, and in fact, the cylindrical growth units are heavily adopted in the in all startups that we see in the uh, well grown factories as well. See, this is how they look like. You can see this a lot of both vertically horizontal, vertical one, and within the controlled environment. So, you can also see for this fruit. And in the multi flow, uh, which is like it could be one floor could be for greens, the other floor could be for another crop with a different module and environment, it could be like plant module one, two, three, four, like this, and each one of it could be different, sustaining different production production module. Like high wire module means it's like generally for the uh, the ones the crops that require high light kind of thing. See, this, this, this is how it, it all uh, done these two types. Now, what are the considerations that are required that are generally done in this vertical farm is like choice of the crop, which crop you want to grow. 
and then what is the economics of it the choice of crop most of the leafy vegetables herbs and all of these are easy to grow in this there are certain uh, very few uh, non uh, leafy vegetables that are getting into much research need to happen optimization need to happen even breeding has to happen probably to make many of them amenable for this kind of endeavor then economic certainly to start with depending on what kind of uh, vertical farming one has to take it's really expensive to start the break, break even point is, is arrived quite heavily, I mean, quickly, but then initial investment is quite high, depending on what kind of vertical farm one starts. Then environmental effect, in fact, it is very friendly with environmental effect. Many times, if it, if it comes up nearer to the um, uh, big markets, like uh, big places, then even the environmental effect that would come because of the transport of the food that also would come down, and many other effects that conventional agriculture has in terms of greenhouse gases and other things is overcome here. Indeed, it is very environmentally friendly. Energy requirement is certainly quite high, depending on what kind of model we adopt, method we adopt. And there is a need uh, here, like uh, you know, solar, non-conventional uh, energy to be utilized into this kind of work. There are like crops like, you know, array of microgreens are uh, currently being used in this, like about 25 microgreens, salad, strawberries, lettuce, spinach, you know, many of them, many assorted leafy vegetables are being used by multiple companies, startups that are there. Right in Bangalore, we could see farm videos, then in some of these that, are, that have come up in Bangalore. And then there are also companies that are trying to provide software solutions and hardware solutions, which are, which are indirectly linked to uh, this vertical farming farming in Bangalore and uh, cities like is it or Dr. Prakadin? Dr. Pakudin. Desert Agriculture Initiative of uh, this uh, towards uh, Saudi Arabia. In fact, uh, billions of dollars they have initiated trying to bring just grains and try to work both on uh, biotic and abiotic uh, for this desert agriculture initiative. Another company is Sundrop in Australia. They are trying to purify the water from the ocean and then try to create this kind of massive horticulture facility to grow food. Uh, this kind of multiple initiatives have been coming in the in fact in past two years there are multiples of them, them coming up and then even uh, trying to expand the ones that are there since they are making sense. Uh, this uh, slide I wanted to put one Mr. C. V. Prakash is trying to make a big difference over the past 10, 10 uh, years or so like during uh, the pandemic he also made a quite big difference. He also hosts the Hydroponic Center of Excellence in Deshpande Foundation at Hubli. Started at Bangalore, he expanded his uh, hydroponic and uh, vertical farm, kind of beginning to start with hydroponics and now he's trying to do a lot of vertical farming across many cities in India and he also has moved his uh, business to other uh, destinations. Now the new technologies, this, uh, mm, this potential has been listed, two of them is like new technologies with increased efficiency, two of them uh, qualify for this disruptive kind of uh, approach that we try to have. One is genetic modification and cultured meat. The other is applying 3D printing technology to the food. What is the genetic genetic modification is basically we're talking about CRISPR-Cas technology because it allows greater selectivity and reduces the element of chance when you are trying to modify the gene in the genome. And that really makes it to be quite subtle technology. And this technology is becoming more and more affordable and more precise and therefore, this has the uh, ability to disrupt the process and increase, I mean, come out with the good products, both animal and plant products that are uh, to meet this current challenge that we are researching. Then the cultured meat, and I'm sure uh, all of us, we know about it, and it's something that came up, and uh, there are companies uh, that, that, are, that have come up now in the Netherlands, and they're trying to make this available. And very recently, a couple of weeks ago, Singapore deregulated it. It allowed, I mean, Singapore permitted for the, uh, permitted this particular cultured meat uh, for the commercial use. So uh, there, are, there, are, there are already uh, commercial units coming. And this is likely to make a big difference to meet the food and nutrition security in days ahead. Because it is cultured meat. This is a meat without butcher, right? 
so is likely to have acceptability and a number of issues are there uh, i'm sure any new technology will have this kind of hiccups and we will have to address them 3d printing technology this is completely a different uh, kind of thing but it has relevance here a new era of food commercialization i mean customization and elaboration but where it makes sense for us now to look into this direction is it replaces the base ingredients of food with renewables like algae, duckweed, grass, microgreens, etc. And many of them can be produced in a large scale in, in single facility, at a single facility like a vertical farm kind of facility and get into this kind of uh, 3D printing. Uh, it, it serves both uh, preservation and also transportation and, and its, uh, its uh, acceptability for future. So this is likely to make a big impact and uh, qualify to be a disruptive technology uh, to meet the future challenges. Then incorporate cross-industry technologies and applications. This is somewhere uh, the, uh, the next generation agriculture makes a big difference. Uh, efficiency and productivity uh, in precise in precision agriculture. Farms become more connected. And by 2025, 1 billion agriculture IOTs are likely to be in use. In fact, it, it, by now it, it would have reached that number because increasing number of IoT devices in one or other form are getting into agriculture realm. A big opportunity, also a big complexity to say, because agriculture 3.0, uh, what we refer to, the current agriculture or agriculture that's been there from since 1930, a lot of GPS data is being captured, but we really don't know what to do with that particular data. We are confused. But as we go on, this is likely to be solved, and new software and capabilities and the advancement in computer technology is likely to make a big difference. The use of cognitive technologies that help understand, learn, reason, interact, uh, and increase the efficiency is, is happening, in fact, wherever that is there, and it's likely to impact more uh, as we go on. What are the trends, trends in agriculture, digital trends in agriculture? One is Internet of Things, IoT. IoT sensors in field, IoT and sensors in equipment, uh, two different things. Then automation of skill and workforce, drones and crop monitoring with chatbots, Farming and robotics, RFID sensors and tracking, machine learning and analytics, or like data driven farming, all these six are likely to impact very heavily the coming agriculture and then food supply and, and, and taking the food to the destination. So, uh, IoT to look at IoT alone, uh, what is like correlated and uh, structured and unstructured data to be correlated heavily. It, it provides insights into agriculture operations, right? And that will have a uh, greater impact on the decisions to be taken. IBM is coming out with IBM, Watson, and a number of companies are coming out with this kind of applications now. Uh, and multiple initiatives and bankers. Now, when we see at KSAT, uh, Karnataka government uh, initiative, there are multiple companies coming forward uh, trying to pitch this kind of initiative uh, into the agriculture level. Now, automation of the uh, automation uh, of uh, skill and workforces. By 2050, many people are likely to get into urban areas and rural work, workforce would reduce. And therefore, new technologies will be needed to ease the workload on the farmer. Operations will be more remotely done and processes will be automated. And this trend is happening quite heavily. And, uh, I mean, to tell you a simple thing, uh, the telephone or uh, the uh, handset is used now, mobile is used now to switch on and switch off the uh, bore well by a farmer. Uh, the, look at the tendency. So this is true in any other operation. In future, farmers will be not just uh, agriculture. That they, they would not be pure agriculturists. Agriculture, I mean, people educated with agriculture. They would be both biologists and technologists. Put together would be a farmer of future. Data-driven farming, like uh, uh, whether be it seed, soil, and multiple aspects that are in, involved in agriculture, the data would be collected from that and then use it. Uh, and, and because of that, it would be more informed decision by a farmer than otherwise. We see bulk of it happening in uh, Israel for now. Chatbots, chatbots are there in retail, travel, media, insurance companies, insurance sector uh, right now. And this is likely to happen heavily. It's happening and it's likely to increase heavily in agriculture as well. Agriculture uh, processes assisted by the chatbots is becoming more. Right now, we have multiple apps available. In, the, in fact, in the past five years, the number of companies that have come up with apps for agriculture is, is more. Ten years ago, uh, we did not have something like that. But now we have multiple apps in, in our cell phones that would help us in one or other way, that would help farmer in one or other way to make a decision. 
robotics, this, this is going to make a difference. Chemical applications in orchard, mechanical breeding, autonomous practice, all of this are impacting agriculture, getting into fields of agriculture. Drone, like UAV, uh, unmanned aerial vehicles, unmanned aerial vehicle systems, they like an autonomous smart swarm of drones that's collecting data and then perform tasks, like try to go collect data and then interpret it and then get back the, uh, with, uh, you know, kind of operations that are required. The biggest obstacle here is the sensor capabilities to collect the high quality data. But as, as we discussed in the beginning, every year is a different year for this particular sector. Sensors are improving heavily. Software is making it a reality, and the destination like Bangalore and India is really great for this. One of the most promising areas in agriculture is drone application, and investments and relaxed and related environment is something that is part uh, here by these companies and initiatives. Six ways in which drones are used in uh, throughput the crops, like throughout the crop cycle, is like soil and field related analysis, planting, crop sprays, crop monitoring, irrigation, health assessment, you know, in this, in, in these operations, which cover almost everything. Uh, and it's nice to really see the both the central government and state government is in one or other way trying to assist this, and that kind of assistance is increasing in the recent past. GPS guiding, like GPS guided. Uh, unmanned real, uh, aerial vehicle systems where CPS assisted operations are increasing. It's increasing, in fact, for the past three decades to say. In the last one decade and last five years, it's, it's really more in India. And auto steering operations are coming, the uh, tractor set, uh, I mean, autonomous tractor kind of thing. GPS guided farms and production units is a common thing now. And continuous operation, operating reference stations for uh, is becoming uh, is integral part of this kind of, this kind of endeavor, and this is how the, the grids are created, and they serve as the sense for any operations to be carried out. This is the kind of improvement that has happened now. Point one meter uh, contours are differentiated by these drones, and the, that's the kind of resolution that we have. That means ten centimeters apart. If there is anything that is uh, that means the resolution that we can have is ten centimeters. So that means we can differentiate 10 centimeters uh, distance on the ground in the, in the crop. That means quite a lot. Precision spraying, because of this precision spraying technology, like uh, uh, control over uh, section control, uh, height control, nozzle flow, droplet size, any of these things can be controlled now and automated. And not that spray entire field in the, in the same way, spray where what is to be sprayed and how much to be sprayed, with what, what kind of flow. You should have now all of that can be controlled and variable rates of fertilizer application uh, is, is not that entire field go and apply same fertilizer same quantity as tomorrow definitely no so sample all over the field create fertility maps this kind of fertility map and differentially apply fertilizer where what and how much to be applied is the is the thing that is likely to happen it is happening likely to happen in a more way uh, all over all over the globe now apart from this this UA uh, uh, aeroplanes and satellites, they, they can also be used to monitor the drought, different drought that is happening within a field where crop is more stressed, where it is not uh, not more stressed, and differentially apply the water. And uh, and then also where the yields are more, where yields are less, and what is that yield pattern that is happening within a field, and thereby uh, you can approach it differently. And that becomes a base data for you know, next to uh, treat that particular piece of land. Imagine this kind of uh, data for a plant breeder would be great. Now, connecting smart machines and multiple stakeholders is happening, be it suppliers, customers, consultants, authorities, and all sorts of things that are involved in uh, around farming are getting connected. In fact, we can see this right now happening in a, at, at a certain level, and then there is a clear interaction among them. And as we move on, this is likely to happen heavily. And that kind of data, once it is in a cloud computing manner with required uh, analytics, will be really useful for all sectors to go and that, that, that will help a uh, much better decision to make and then apply it on the, uh, in the real world. The ICRISAT is trying to use these communication strategies. In fact, ICT is uh, quite heavily uh, to reach out to the farmer. They have, uh, this is happening almost for the past 10 years and now it is it's become a routine over there and many institutions are following, including universities to certain level, they're trying to use this kind of data. 
And one thing I wanted to present is this particular report. Digital technologies are in fact impacting how. September uh, 2017, the world's first entirely machine-operated barley crop was harvested. Having sown, having been sown and tended without a human ever entering into the field. It happened at Harper Adams University in UK. And this became the milestone illustrating cutting edge technology and agriculture, digital technology in the field of agriculture. Now, the other aspects that are likely to impact heavily is nanotechnology and precision agriculture. Nanotechnology, Government of India already deregulated, I mean, uh, permitted to use the nano fertilizer, nano urea, and such similar uh, nanotechnologies are likely to impact in near future. Regulatory issues is going to be definitely one, and base data is going to create another thing. But with all that, these things will definitely likely to happen as we move on, and they are likely to bring a lot of precision and uh, would save the um, bad effects of uh, the uh, whatever the inputs that we use into the agriculture and become more um, economical. Biosensor that can detect pesticides in crop, leading to more information is likely to happen, and it's bad in fact happening. The role of government in all this is agriculture 4.0 is an opportunity indeed. Government should really get into this and try to do. And, and then the traditional industry promoter facilitator approach is not enough here. Like a traditional, traditionally we we approaching like just promoting or facilitating the industry. That kind of thing would not be, not be enough here. Follow a targeted goal oriented approach. That would be something that is really uh, required here. And these scenarios like financial incentives, regulatory flexibility, providing infrastructure at an affordable price uh, to the startups, and uh, also wherever the devices are available for them to be adopted in the, by the farmers, and then encouraging the innovations and startups, and then setting up of incubation centers in universities and in, uh, institutions is important. But it's nice to really see that both at center uh, and at state certain level of encouragement is there for this kind of initiatives personally as I see and more of it is really required and there, uh, to make this a more reality. Uh, thank you very much. This is what I wanted to share with you today. I'm not really a, I'm basically a plant builder, but I closely follow these things uh, for myself and so I thought I should share this uh, with everybody. Uh, thank you, sir. If there are any questions, I'll be happy.